This next section is one of the most important sections that we will do all day. Uh, just because it was truly part of the motivation of why the Delta Regional Authority has become so interested and so engaged with workforce training and development. We believe fundamentally from a policy perspective that any type of endeavor should be rooted on the needs of business and industry when it comes to training our workforce. A truly business and industry centric approach. How we're doing it through K through 12, our two years, our community colleges, even the four years. That model needs to have an incredible footprint as it relates to the needs of business and industry through the lens of economic development. That's our fundamental premise. And so we wanted to make sure that we had business and industry as a part of the conversation today. You've heard Linda talk about it in our report. It's key to, and it's threaded all throughout our four basic recommendations. And this conversation we feel like is pretty important because you heard Randy this morning talk about the response, the critical level that we have to do something. States are moving much faster than we are and we need to make sure we get on that same path. So we've asked one of our partners and I'd like to actually take a point of personal privilege and say thank you to all of our partners today, our convening partners, our strategic partners that are with us today. Randy Zook with the Arkansas State Chamber, Jim Youngquist, Institute of Economic Advancement, our partners at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, the Department of Workforce Services, Department of Higher Ed, we had, had uh, Mr. Broadway here earlier. Arkansas Economic Development Commission, Steve Sparks. We really appreciate these partnerships because they do matter and they help us do the work that we have. And one of those partners is Arkansas Talk Business and Politics. And I know many of you all probably follow that publication. I think it's one of the most regarded business and political publications in the state. We refer to it often and Roby does an incredible job, he and his team, on the content of what's happening in the business community and what's happening in politics in Arkansas. And so when you want to know what's happening, you want to have a, a, your, your thumb on what's going on, go to the website, pick up one of the magazines, and you'll truly get a sense of what's happening with business and industry and politics in this state. And so we were honored and proud that Roby was willing to come and moderate this next section for us. And so ladies and gentlemen, I'll turn the panel over to Roby Brock, Arkansas Talk Business. All right, thank you. All right, uh, I left my checkbook in the car, Chris. I'll uh, cut that check when I get back. So thank you all for having us here today. I'm gonna let our uh, distinguished panel uh, introduce themselves here in just a second as we run through it. It's Tim McKenna, Annette Klein, uh, Mike Garner, and, or do you go by Michael? Either. Either, all right. And you are, um, heard of you, Randy Zook with the State Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> Uh, now, I've instructed all of our panelists except Tim, who just kind of wandered in here late. Uh, but uh, So you're getting your preview now. But I, I want solutions from this group. We've talked a lot about the challenges and some of the issues that are out there. That's great, and, and they can bring those up. But I want to hear their perspective on potential solutions, what they've seen in other states, what they've seen internally in their own operations, and how they see uh, potential solutions to some of the issues and challenges that have been brought up today. So. Let's start with Tim and work our way back. Just introduce yourself and, and who you're with and a little bit of reason why you're here today. All right, thanks, Roby. Uh, Tim McKenna, and uh, I work for Axiom. I'm uh, director of talent acquisition, which is over recruiting for the company um, globally. And then also I, I um, lead our workforce planning efforts as well. So glad to be here today. Thanks for having me. And Tim and I were in college together, and I'm about four years older than Tim, but he's catching up with me on the gray hair front. I like that. So. I'm Annette Klein, and I'm with Straw Manufacturing, which has our facilities about a quarter of a mile from here. We've been here since 1964. Um, on the handout, it says I'm a member of CR board, but I'm a former. I term limited out. But, right. So I have dealt with uh, the two-year colleges for about 14 or 15 years and working with their workforce. Um, I've got lots of, of questions and suggestions and stuff, but I'll get into those Hold as on. we go on. Huh? I'm Michael Garner. I'm with uh, Highs Automation and Highs Factory Outlets. Uh, we sell and service Highs machine tools uh, across the southeast. We're one of Highs' largest distributors. And I run the distributorship for Arkansas, Tennessee, Alabama, and the Florida Panhandle. 
but you've probably already caught on by the voice. I'm an Arkansas boy, uh, just, just, over, just up the road in Sheridan. I've uh, been in this industry for 25 years, uh, have been educated in it, but also a machinist by trade. I uh, had the opportunity in 1991 to buy the third highest machine that come in the state of Arkansas. And I've had the opportunity for the last 16 years to run this business. And uh, my perspective is a little bit different because I'm, again, kind of a homeboy. And it's kind of a personal thing to me to see the deficit that we have in Arkansas with a skilled workforce. Are you from Sheridan or are you from East End? Let's well, be I'm, specific here. I'm from, I'm, I'm from East End, but I went to school in Sheridan. Or Sheridan, as some of us like to say. <laughs> Claimed he was from Yellville, Arkansas, and so we went to go visit him one summer. And it turns out he wasn't really from Yellville. When we finally tracked him down, he said, "Well, I'm, I'm really from a suburb of Yellville called Ralph." <laughs> Ralph Arkansas. So when we went to Ralph, Arkansas, we went outside of the city limits or the town limits of Ralph, and we found him at the end of a dirt road. I said, "You're not even from a. You're from a suburb of Ralph." <laughs> All right, Randy. Uh, Randy Zook with the State Chamber of Commerce. We're made up of about 1,300 businesses across the state. You know, any kind of business you can name, we're, they're probably members of ours. So uh, that's my role. Uh, my job is to represent those businesses on policy issues. All right. Uh, hold that microphone, and we're going to work our way back down here um, while I get worked on. Whoa. Oh, my goodness. I'll hold it right up here by my mouth. Is that good? I'm just trying to Test, test. It's working. <laughs> all right. Might have to I got all these microphones. Ooh, I'm a rock star. Baby. <laughs> all right. Uh, no, y'all use this one and we'll work our way back down. All right. Well, I want to hear about some solutions. We've talked about a lot of the problems that are uh, kind of present in our workforce training, our workforce development right now. So, Randy, I'll give you first crack just in a general overview. What do you, what, name me two things, three things that Arkansas needs to do different that you feel like is a solution to the problems that are out there. Uh, the first thing I think is we need to expose our junior high and high school kids to a broader range of uh, possibilities. Uh, kids have a very narrowly defined uh, sense of, of what employment and job and career opportunities exist. They basically know what goes on in their family. They know what they see. Uh, they know what they do if they've got uh, some sort of part-time job or whatever. So exposing them to those opportunities, I think, would, would go a long way to, to um, uh, solving some of these fundamental problems. We're working on that this summer for the first time with uh, seven uh, manufacturing camps that we put on in conjunction with uh, uh, seven of the, the two-year community colleges uh, to just just give kids a chance to see what goes on in a manufacturing business. Kids drive by these big boxes and have no idea what happens in those in those plants. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, we also have a, a program coming up in October called Manufacturing Day in conjunction with the National Association of Manufacturers where we'll offer plant tours for students. And let me take an opportunity here. Shelly, raise your hand. If you want to know what to do in a community about how to expose kids to technical and career opportunities, corner her before she gets out of town. Uh, she does more single-handedly through the, Jam the uh, Jonesboro Chamber of Commerce than anybody else in the state in this whole area except Steve Sparks and Jane English. I would put those three uh, against anybody uh, in the South and in the U.S. in terms of doing things that are having a direct impact on uh, helping kids see the opportunities in different careers. So that's, that's the main thing, I think. Michael? Well, you kind of stole my thunder there, Randy. Um, I, think, I think we could break it down to two things. And uh, first and foremost, we have to invest in the technical training facilities like we have at Mid-South Community College. I uh, had the opportunity to work with Dr. Gunner. And uh, if you haven't been over to West Memphis, uh, Mid-South Community College has probably the flagship program for advanced manufacturing in the state. And uh, that was pretty much a directive by Dr. Gunner. He brought in to head that up and did a wonderful job. So having the programs in place, we can talk about it, we can talk about it, we can talk about it. We have to get on board with it. Uh, in the Southeast, 
We have 300 schools that we work with. They have 800 machines in these training programs. And, you know, these are schools that train for companies like GE, Baldor Electric here in Arkansas. But there's, there's some big name companies that are getting their workforces from these training programs. Um, in those programs, there's about 300 machines. Unfortunately, uh, excuse me, there's 800 machines in those 300 programs. Unfortunately, out of the 300 programs, there's only 17 of those programs in the state of Arkansas. And when you look across the seven states that I'm referring to, Arkansas, Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, the Carolinas, and Virginia, and then the Florida Panhandle, you'll find that when you start ranking um, economic development, acquisition of new industry, you'll find that Arkansas ranks at the bottom. And what I hear from manufacturers is it's not the tax incentives. Everybody gets competitive. That's called negotiations at the closing. It is the ability to hire and find a trained workforce. So without the technical facilities, we're not going to train them. The other thing that's important to that, once those are in place, it's all about recruitment. And it starts with grassroots programs like Randy just described, the Young Manufacturers Academies that took place last week or the last two weeks. Uh, more opportunities to educate young people on the programs that are available, the careers, the sustainable careers in manufacturing. So um, it, it's about putting in place technical training facilities and then recruitment. And I can give you two examples over the last 16 years where I've worked with the state of Alabama with the Alabama Industrial uh, Development Training Group and in Tennessee, the Tennessee Board of Regents. And they're not still talking about it. They've done something about it. In March of 2008, we sold the state of Tennessee 100 machines. And that was to go to 26 different Tennessee Technology Centers, recently changed the name to Tennessee College of Applied Technology to educate the workforce and to create a trained workforce. In the state of Tennessee today, now we represent Haas Machine Tools, the largest American machine tool manufacturer, pretty much the largest machine tool manufacturer by volume in the world. In the state of Tennessee, you're 45 minutes, no matter where you live, you're 45 minutes from being able to be trained on a Haas machine. And that is important to industry. So those are two examples of where we've worked with, and that's what the state of Arkansas needs to do. All right, pass on to Annette there. Real quick, too, if any of you are tweeting or uh, active on social media, uh, hashtag Delta Workforce if you want to share some comments for what's being made. Annette. Oh, we're going to sound like parrots all lined up here. It yeah, is. Uh, <laughs> talk a little bit about, and you've got a, a much different workforce model than some other folks do. It, in do you want me to go into that workforce model now? Okay. Uh, we gave up on getting kids from technical schools. And so we decided uh, there's, there's another way to do it. First of all, we, we, when the apprenticeship program was in place 10 plus years ago, we did hire through that. We had some of the problem, you know, they'd work ju their junior and senior year and then they'd go off, uh, we'd teach them a skill and they'd go off, which that was okay. I mean, we were training somebody. But um, in, in 2005, we were really, could not find any workers. And I had a, a guy come in with a workman's comp and I was gonna lose him for, for months. So I called the prison system in Pine Bluff. They have what they call a work release program. And in Pine Bluff, there, at one time at their height, they had 120 beds, zero unemployment. So I got a, a young guy who was about 34 years old. He was from Cabot. He came in, he had worked in a tool and die shop, made a little meth, got caught, got thrown in, in the prison. Uh, he came out and, and, and worked for us. He started in 2005. He is still with me today. We have bought him over a million dollars worth of CNC equipment to run. He runs a, a turning center and a, a lathe. He, um, we have sent him off to be trained at 
his competitor. <laughs> That's okay. But, uh, you know, I have a standing order with the Arkansas prison system that any machinist that comes through, uh, I get first dabs, and I picked one up about two months ago from Pace Industry out of Harrison. So we're, we're just, and he worked on Haas at Harrison. We've, um, since 2005, we've had 17 work, 18 work release people. Right now, we presently have five that are incarcerated, three that are on parole and have stayed with us. We, the thing we like about them, they're there every day, on time, every day, eager to work, drug free, alcohol free, and they want to make a difference. They want to make a difference. Uh, my, my biggest complaint, and I complain to the um, to the prison about this all the time, is that every one of their prisoner that's going to come up for work release needs to go through their vocational training school. Most of ours have some training. We're lucky if we get some, but the other ones are eager to learn. And, and when they leave us, they have a skill. You also do a deal with them where you um, allow them to save some of the money that they're earning the, the prison, that's a part of the program. Right. So we they pay, pay it in. Back to their families, but you can also, they can buy their own tools. Yes, uh huh. When they do uh, finally get off of right. uh, parole. Right. If uh, the newest machinist we had now had to, to he's had to buy about a thousand dollars worth of, of calibers and, and tools like that, that. That we do a payroll deduct, and he'll he'll take it with him if he goes, or keep it if he stays with us. Right. I, I want to ask you a follow-up question outside of the prison system, I mean, that, that doesn't seem to me like a, a good long-term strategy for us, although we have plenty of incarcerated people in Arkansas, but uh, what other solutions do you think need to be in place to provide this skilled workforce that you're looking for? I think there has to be a change in junior and high, high school. Their mentality is that everybody has to go to college and they have to have a college degree. There are so many blue collar jobs available. Um, people like our business, we, we, don't, we have CNC equipment, but we also have manual lays and we have um, jobs that are not robotic. We still need a, welders, we need, you know, we have on an average five to six welders. We have fabricators. They're not high tech jobs, but the kids nowadays think, well, I've got to go to college, and when they get out, they don't want a job paying what, we can still use a college education or an associate degree. But going, Steve, I'm gonna tell you about this. I, three or four years ago, I went out to all the two-year colleges that had machining programs. They could not make a class in teaching. So, I mean, y'all have the, the programs. The problem is you can't get, you, what is it? You can bring the horse to the water, but you can't make him drink. And, and that is our problem. We have told these kids they have to have all these degrees and stuff, right. but we still need workers. All right. Tim. You got a different, yeah, you're good. You got a different workforce that you're, yeah, that, and your business model's changing some too. In it terms is. Of where Axiom's looking for talent. That's so. right, that's right. So um, if I were to focus on our central Arkansas facilities, probably most pertinent, um, some of the things that we've had some success with, well, first of all, I'll start with our challenge. I thought it was interesting, those of you that know DICE, um, which is a job board that specializes in technical talent, they do different surveys. They came back in January and noted that of all the Midwest, and they categorized Arkansas in the Midwest, for better or worse there, uh, they, they ranked Little Rock um, the, among the five hardest places to find technical talent. And of course, you know, my team, recruiting team, was not surprised by that, but um, it, did, it, it did give us a bit of a challenge. We've also got locations in the other major areas that are challenged, like San Francisco and New York, but for Central Arkansas, where we've had some success has been to show that line of sight of what someone could be doing with their career and trying to get in front of them, I think as Randy was mentioning, and some of you too, early on. So we've, we've done some things partnering up for, I'll, I'll give two examples, UCA and UALR, 
where we will help them actually recruit technical students into their computer science and MIS programs uh, by doing some summer camps that Axiom will participate in. Bring them in, let them see the jobs, tour facilities of Axiom, HP, other companies, have a lot of guest speakers among the, uh, uh, our workforce talking about their jobs with the students that are thinking about where they're going to go to school and what programs to go into. And we've seen results. We've been doing that for a number of years. I was interviewing at Arkansas Tech recently and was talking to someone. I said, well, where did you, why did you become interested in Axiom? And he said, well, Allison Nicholas came in and talked to my EAST program when I was in ninth grade. Uh, I was able to go to the summer camp before I attended I, was, I started at UCA and I went to the summer camp learning about careers, transferred to tech, and you guys have always been number one on my list. So helping to kind of show what the careers can be early enough to before they decide to go a different route has helped us quite a bit. The other big thing that helps us is really the try before you buy for both people doing internship programs. So we really work hard to try to have interns. We've averaged about 65 to 75 internships each year over the last several years. And um, where that helps out is that uh, the students, in a lot of cases, we have campuses close. We have our Axiom sites close to some campuses, and they can actually do their part-time work while they're going to school, working 15 to 20 hours at Axiom. They're able to learn our jobs. The programs are all pretty good about giving the basics in computer science or whatever it is that we're trying to recruit. And then we're able to teach them a lot of the niche skills that they'll need. Uh, it's been great for Axiom because we end up hiring about half of the interns into permanent jobs. And I think it also helps the schools because the students are going back and sharing real life examples of how they're applying what they're learning in the classroom uh, and talking about it with their faculty and also with uh, their peers. So it's kind of a nice, um, a nice balance for both the university, the students, and also for Axiom. Um, we've also had some real good success on some areas that are kind of tricky to, um, well, we've had success having adjunct professors, people that are working at Axiom actually go into the universities and help teach some of the skills that we're looking for. Um, you know, SQL query language is one that's really needed for a lot of our jobs and we have, um, we have some Axiom uh, associates are actually teaching those classes in schools and doing some different things like that. Even if we can't teach a full class, we like to get in and do a seminar or have um, uh, a, a speaker um, join the classroom to try to help out that way too. So those are just a few of the things that have worked pretty well with us to keep a, a feeder program coming into our full-time jobs. Hold on to that microphone. Let's open it up for questions from you all. we got where the rubber's meeting the road here. So let's ask some questions of these business and industry folks. Yes, ma'am. Um, I know that colleges, most colleges, um, have the internship well, the employees have internships that are can y'all hear me without the mic? <laughs> okay, okay. I'm, I'm trying to make sure I get my, my thoughts right. Um, first, of, first of all, I want to say I do agree that um, um, learning new skills or getting into the workforce should start at the 11th and 12th grade year. Um, the, the JAG program that the high schools offer now, I don't have a lot of knowledge of it. Um, what I understand is that the, the, I think it's seniors, I'm not sure if it's 11th grade, but 12th graders, they're able to maybe go to school to like 12 and then go to work. Um, have, have you guys thought about those students being able to get into the, the workforce, maybe doing internships from that level so that they can get an understanding of what they're going to need to do when they do get into the workforce? Um, you know, they may, uh, if, if from, from that standpoint, they can determine whether or not they want to go into manufacturing or if they want to go into the service industry. If they start early, then before they get to college, they'll know, no, that's not what I want to do. Does that, does that make sense? Uh, manufacturing, several years ago, they had what they called an apprenticeship program, and it was exactly that. It was 11th and 12th grade, because uh, you had, with the government rules and regulations, you know, technically, I cannot hire anybody in my plant under 18. Right. And this exempted us and got us permission to hire these. I mean, that's a problem with internships is with all the government regulations and stuff like that, industry just can't go out and hire anybody. 
there, there, there are limitations. Apprenticeship worked really good. They went to school in the mornings, finished up their core classes, had a, uh, and then came out and did their welding with us. Uh, but they discontinued that program. I don't know if it was lack of interest or, or what. But but that's kind of what you're saying. Yes, ma'am. I I just I don't know. I guess, um, and I, I know there are rules and regulations. But I, you know, it's been so so many, um, well, I guess frustration. So many words about employers not getting what they need. If the students, if we can start them early enough, you know, they'll have a better understanding of what it is they're going to have to do. So if we start at the 11th and 12th grade, I guess what I'm saying, if they could go, if, if they're able to do an internship, you know, working temporary hours just to get a little feel of what they'll be doing in particular industries, that may help, you know, that may help out in the long run. Michael, you want to take a crack at that? Yeah. I've seen him nodding his head there. Yeah, I, I get uh, just some comments to that. Um, the age limitation is the issue in a manufacturing plant. You do have to be over 18. Uh, but one area where you might think back about, in the 70s and 80s, most of the high schools in the state of Arkansas had shop classes, they had welding classes, they had woodworking, they had auto mechanics. I, I know because I'm a product of one of them. So if you'll take a look around the high schools now, across the state of Arkansas, they're very numbered and limited. Um, Congressman Hutchinson spoke about North Arc and Harrison. I had the opportunity to work with the president of that college to set that program up. And we had to circumvent the system because he wanted to hire an instructor. And we talked about instructors, and that mentioned the, the lack of qualified instructors. And I had to convince him, look, I know a guy that has the experience. He doesn't have a college degree. But surely there's some way you can cut the red tape and use his work experience as enough credentials to teach the program. And uh, connected these two people, and that's what got that program off the ground. Uh, the other thing is with you know, getting these programs back at the high school level, it gives that exposure, it gives that experience. What we're trying to do now, I, I take the opportunity to go speak wherever they'll hear me, and, and this was one of them. So, <laughs> so you'll got me as the last straw. Um, but the opportunity is to expose these young kids to manufacturing. Um, uh, Congressman Hutchinson also mentioned Rich Mountain Community College, another great two-year program that's got a great instructor that's partnered with the local high schools. I spoke last year at their manufacturing days. They had about 60 kids in a room much like this, speaking to these kids, showing them, actually using um, different industries here in Arkansas, different products that they use every day. They have no idea that it all starts with our ability to cut and shape metal. That's where it begins, everything. This microphone I'm using. So exposure, is, is ha it has to happen in the, at the high school level, but it also, you know, much like Tim's describing of going in and recruiting, again, that's what I said earlier about recruiting tools. You know, we can't, we can't give these, put these programs in place and then tell the instructor, okay, go find a class. Go fill your class. It doesn't work. They're technical trade skills people. They don't necessarily know how to sell or know how to recruit. And that's where local industry has to come in. We have to give these people our services to go out and speak to these young kids. So on October the 3rd for Manufacturing Day, if we could get every manufacturer in the state of Arkansas to sign up with their local high school to be able to give a tour and to expose these young kids, I promise you there will be a certain percentage of those kids that will turn their eyes and turn their their thoughts towards a career in manufacturing. Randy wants to make a comment. I think he wants to uh, reduce the child labor laws in the state of Arkansas. <laughs> uh, eight has a good sound to it. Uh, just a quick note to the educators in the room. You must begin to move at the speed of business. You cannot continue to move at the skip speed of academia. We will never succeed if we have to have classes to teach people technical skills that take a year or a semester when it could be done in five weeks. You need to be offering instruction in these opportunities in bite-sized pieces so a guy or gal can go in and get a skill and go back and put it to work within weeks, not within months. This is, this is, this is, I know it's, I know it's a profound problem for you, but you got to figure this out, you know? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, you're right, but um, that's great. We would love to do that. The problem is they can't afford to pay for it and they don't qualify for financial aid. Y'all can go 
that issue. Uh, thank you. I'm You're sorry. Welcome. You know, um, I have a truck driving program, four-week class. We have jobs lying in the paper every day. We have people coming in to our campus every day. They can't afford to pay for it. I just got a text. An employer is going to hire someone and pay for them to come. We have to have more of those models to support that. We can do the training quickly. We just can't find that funding source oftentimes. There's plenty of room for blame in this big overall picture. And one room for blame rests squarely on businesses' shoulders. We've got to recognize that we got to invest in training. we got to invest in skills, and that's a good example. I know Maverick says they could hire 500 drivers if they walked in the door ready to go. That's a big deal. Hey, Steve Williams will pay for all that training. Trust me, he will. All right, we got a question I, here, and then up in the uh, up top on the top row afterwards. Uh -huh. Actually, I had kind of a similar question because we we're talking about attracting employees. But I was kind of wondering for those employees that already work there and that continuously learning and upgrading their skills. What are your internal um, incentive programs, like tuition reimbursement, or any programs to incentivize them to upgrade their skills? So, just one. Uh, we do. We reimburse our the tuition when the the student finishes the course, or, or we work out something with the local um, community college if they're going in to take an electrical course and they're doing it at night on their own hours. Uh, we also have, if if we're training somebody who's really interested, we will send them out of state to schools. I've sent several to Tulsa for extra training, or I've sent one to Alabama for extra training. So, we, if, if the person is willing to make the effort, we're willing to help pay for it. Tim, you want to take a stab at that? Sure. So after one year of service at Axiom, um, we will reimburse individuals going in for further training as long as they get an A or a B in the coursework. So that's how we do ours. We're also looking at ways where we, actually our person in charge of training for the company is looking at uh, um, ways to partner up with some of the local universities to see if we want to offer some of the training we need within our workforce to change our skills to get more online skill sets into um, our workforce here in Central Arkansas as an example. Um, are there some ways that we could do that through one of the universities rather than doing that training you know, with our own internal training system? So we're kind of in talks with a few places right now seeing if there's some creative things we can do together. Oh, it's up here. Speaking of the factory tours for students, if that could be done at a time when their parents could be included, then the parents could influence the students. I think that we have left this to the education system way too long. I don't know how you get parents to participate, but these students need to be influenced not only in school, in the classroom, in the industry, but at home. Yeah, and I, and I agree with that. I've been, a, I've been a voice for, in addition to that, uh, the counselors at the high school and junior high levels. I think the other thing that we're dealing with is most of them have never been inside of a manufacturing facility. So again, it's an opportunity, uh, just to what you said, most of the time the counselors are the only ones that's having a discussion with these young people about what are you going to do? And so they're the ones getting their undivided attention because it's at school and they have to be there. So it's an opportunity to educate the counselors as well. But certainly getting the parents involved. And, you know, this year really will be our second stab at manufacturing days. And I believe we'll continue to build on that. And the more people we can get involved, the more people we can get behind it, the better off we're going to be. Get those parents involved and then it <clears throat> becomes a little tricky. Do they encourage them to do it or do they tell them this would be a terrible career move for you to I, make, which would obviously encourage them I think, to go uh, into the uh, particular one, one statistic, Roby, to put on top of that is to, to understand the significance, and Annette touched on it earlier, there's currently 600,000 manufacturing jobs that are going unfilled in this country today. Those jobs have an, an average income of $74,000. Okay, that sounds significant. Let me throw you another one. There's 12 million people in the U.S. currently employed in the manufacturing sector. Six million of those 12 million, 12 million are going to retire over the next 10 years. So if we don't start doing something now, can't leave this room talking about it. We've got to leave this room taking action individually. Because in 10 years, we've got six and a half million people, and that's what's really going to impact our ability as a country to rely on manufacturing. And trust me, our, our grassroots as a country start with manufacturing. All right, let's go up here. Oh, yeah, sorry, right I have a question in mind is mainly curiosity. I work with Workforce for Services, so I work with the employees and I work with the human resource. 
officers, and I hear human resource officers complain about revolving doors, you know, people's getting fired, quitting, whatever have you. And then I hear the employee talk about the least little thing gets them fired when they're supposed to be on probation. Which would be most more cost effective to stay with that employee until, you know, especially if they don't have good work ethics yet, maybe it's the first time they had a job, or their child was sick and they was fired because they miss work to take care of their child, which is more cost effective to keep those employees there at least through the probationary period to try to get them trained to understand all the responsibility that comes with having a job or to continuously fire them and replace them and begin training again and again and again. That's a good question. Okay. I, I don't know about policies for bigger companies, but we do. We try, if we have somebody come in, and we try to rehabilitate them, but like uh, uh, Asa was talking about, an instructor putting it on the question on the board and then erasing it at 10 minutes after. Some people just never get work ethics. Never get it. I, I don't know if it's something inherent from the house or what, but but we we really try to work with them, really try to rehabilitate them. I mean, I have people that have excessive in a, in a normal situation have excessive absentees that should have been fired, but we will we we'll keep with them until you just the trend you see a trend's never going to change. You know, the person has to ch want to change. But I just wanted to say that as a member of the Arkansas State Chamber of Commerce, I know that the State Chamber has done special programs with um, other large manufacturers to take it from a, a, a different perspective. And Randy, uh, I put you on the point with that one. Which one are you talking about? Where you, you've actually set up, uh, where you've done some pre-screening and we oh. do eight-week courses of trying to... Yeah, that wasn't with the Chamber, that was a AEDC. Okay. Uh, how, how can I tell this, Steve? A large auto parts manufacturer in East Arkansas, a $350 million plant with about, at the time, about 800 employees, after it had just opened, Japanese owner, um, Japanese company, was had, had a turnover that was something in the 65 to 70 percent range. Think about that, 65 to 70 percent of the jobs turned over. Uh, this, it was unacceptable. Uh, Arkansas was getting a bad rap because of this. Uh, we lost a auto, major auto plant due in no small measure to this, this company's experience because it got back to Japan. We went in, Steve Sparks led this initiative. We went in and set up a, a kind of a trial run for these folks uh, because we discovered that their pre pre-employment process was nearly non-existent. If you could if you could fog a mirror, they'd put you on the floor of the plant and, and expect you to expect you to start doing the job and then wonder why you left at the first break that came up. Well, people were being put into jobs, they didn't have a clue what they were supposed to be doing. So Steve set up this program with the, one of the community colleges. We would screen the employees, select them, put them through this eight-week uh, sort of trial period where they were sort of doing make work to test their work skills, to test, test their work ethic, to test their ability to learn. And then suddenly their, their turnover dropped to like less than 5%. And, and they were just astounded. Well, the fact was, all we were doing was weeding out the people that had no business being on a manufacturing floor. But we saved the time to do it. Sure. I, I, I take your point. Let me, my answer to your question is the smart companies will do whatever works. Because it costs five, uh, roughly at least $5,000 to turn over an employee. So you can, I mean, it's, it's a math problem. You know, it, it's, not, it's not rocket surgery, as they say. It's a math problem. Five grand, you know, how, how quickly can I figure this out? What was the name of that company again? I, I, didn't hear you say that. I, I don't know which one you're talking about. It's too hard to figure out. All right. We got Let me just question. tell you this. If we had done that earlier, we, our Eastern Arkansas would look a lot different today. To those of you who were talking about reimbursing an employee for going to school, have you ever considered paying for their tuition first, then if they don't, 
meet the minimum qualifications, that they reimburse you uh, for that? Skin in the game. Skin in the game. If you're not willing to front the money, we're happy to pay you back afterwards. But there are a lot of people, though, who cannot afford to... Go see your mama. You know, bar borrow the money. Do some, Figure out some way to do it. I understand the problem. I get it. And sometimes, look, when I was a manufacturing executive, I would loan the money to people sometimes. And, I'd, I'd, you know, they would sign a note. I'll front the money, but you're going to sign a note. And if you quit me between now and completing the course, that's the first thing coming out of whatever we owe you. But you're saying that that would not work. It did work. We would front the money, mm -hmm. but you owed us for it. Well, that's what I was saying. It wasn't a gift. It was a note. That was what I was saying. I wasn't, I wasn't saying to give them the money. Okay. I was saying they were talking about reimbursing an employee for paying it. The smart ones saying, will figure out how, what works. I was saying that to send them to school because there are a lot of people who want to go to school but unfortunately cannot afford it. So if they pay them and if they did not pass the course, then that employee would have to reimburse them. It's not just pass. I don't know if you heard what Tim said, but his A or B will reimburse you. Well, and that's when, when, when I said pass, that's what I meant, his A or B. Some people take a C, but his A or B. <laughs> I worked hard to get C's. <laughs> All right, we got time for one last question. Right here, Roy. Tiffany. You've referred to the um, Arkansas Manufacturing Day or a Manufacturing Day. Is that an Arkansas initiative or is it a Haas initiative that takes place? It's actually the National Association of Manufacturers. We're the, you, the Arkansas agent for, NA, for NAM, and we'll be sponsoring it. It's October 3rd, and uh, we'll, we're, we're in communication with all the two years to some degree or another about... Secondary centers where the yeah. manufacturing component curriculum is taught? They, those people are aware of it so they can invite those students. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. All right, Randy, Michael, Annette, Tim, thank you all very much. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you.